All right. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning-ish, I guess. Uh, and welcome to another episode of The Jazz is Daily Brunch. Uh, today is a great day, folks. Today is Friday, May 8th. It is pianist Mary Lou Williams' birthday. She would have been 110 years old if I did my math right, and I believe I did. It is pianist Keith Jarrett's birthday. He is turning 75 today. And as a matter of fact, uh, ECM Records has released a brand new track by Keith Jarrett from a concert in Hungary from 2016. It's never been heard before. Um, and it's available now on all streaming services. Go, so go check it out on Spotify, on Apple Music, wherever you stream. They've added it to their um, you know, best of Keith Jarrett. This is Keith Jarrett playlist. I just listened to it. It's beautiful. And it is also my birthday. Yes, your host, Brian Zimmerman, digital content editor of Jazz Is Magazine. Turns the page on another year. I am all of 32 years old, but I feel old for my age. Um, anyway, I knew it was going to be a great day today, and not just because uh, the people at McDonald's accidentally put an apple pie in my order this morning. True story. Uh, they must have known. The world must have known. Uh, but because today's guest is the one and only Jay Beckenstein of Spyro Gyra. Um, what a treat for me as a huge fan. Uh, he's going to be joining us in a minute to talk about Spyro. Uh, we may get into their new album, Vinyl Tap, and whatever else happens to come up in conversation. But first, let me go ahead and thank some of this episode's sponsors. So thank you to Concord Jazz. Their new album, Ella 100, Live at the Apollo, is available now for streaming and purchase. It is a live recording from 2016 featuring some superb performances by the likes of Andrew Day, Lettucey, Liz Wright, Cassandra Wilson, Monica Mancini, and not to mention the absolutely swinging Count Basie Orchestra led by trumpeter Scotty, Scotty Barnhart. It was hosted by Grammy Award winning vocalist Patty Austin and Tony Award nominated actor David Allen Greer. And like I said, it is available everywhere now. You can stream it on your favorite uh, streaming service or pick up a copy for yourself. Check out concord.com to learn more. Thanks also to Blue Sound Audio. So Blue Sound is an award winning wireless high res sound system that lets you play music in any and every room throughout your home. You choose music from your favorite streaming service or from a music library connected to your home network. Control where, at what volume, and when music plays with a free Blue OS app for your smartphone, tablet, or desktop computer. And that's it. Getting the kind of crisp and detailed sound that only an audiophile grade system can deliver has never been easier. That is living hi-fi. You can learn more at uh, bluesound.com or at our website, jazzes.com, where we have put together a uh, Blue Sound Buyer's Guide. We're also going to have a buyer's guide in our summer 2020 issue, which we'll be mailing in June. Um, it's all about fusion. So be on the lookout for that, subscribers. Anyway, that'll do it for me and my sponsors. Let's go ahead and welcome today's guest, Mr. Jay Beckenstein. Hi there, Brian. Hey, Jay. How you doing, man? I'm doing just fine. Hanging in there like we all are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's always a touch of I'm doing just, just <laughs> fine. <laughs> fine never took on such a melancholy note than in these times, just fine. But uh, you've been you've been busy playing, listening. How you been biding the time here in lockdown? Gardening. Oh, hey, that's nice. Yeah, that's I have a big backyard. I, you know, I haven't had this much time uh, to myself and off the road for nearly fifty years. So I'm making a vacation out of it somehow. <laughs> in the backyard at least well you're gonna have to have some uh, give some tips to my wife we we're trying to garden too but squirrels keep eating everything stuff just shrivels up in the sun we're having a tough go of it but it's kind of been fun to explore a new hobby <laughs> well hey. it's like my life now i'm watching i'm watching the plants grow in slow motion everything seems like it's gone into gone into slow motion that's right which can be nice at times but jay man your history with jazz's magazine goes back a ways uh you were on one of the first covers back in the 80s in the golden era of jazz's jeff do you have that cover we can pull up let's see here we're working on it stand by here we go yeah <laughs> <laughs> jay looking good There's this looks a like a young man in a loud it, shirt I was going to say, if the feathered hair doesn't say 1986, the Hawaiian shirt certainly does, man. That is a, that is a good look. And how about that price of $1 for an issue of 
Jazz is Magazine. Hey, we're actually, we're still uh, have a subscription offer at that price, 99 cents for a digital subscription. It's just 99 cents per month for three months and you get a free print issue. So, hey, now is the time. Uh, we're still bringing you coverage of jazz icons like Jay Beckenstein. But well, this is 1986. So that would have put you where, Jay? What was going on in your life at that time? Oh, we were touring. You know, we we were selling a lot, a lot of records. But because we had had a platinum record in, I guess it would be 80, 79, we, we had the opportunity to do some fantastic touring through the yeah. 80s based on that. So that's what we were all about. Making a lot of records. I think we made 10 records in 10 years. Uh, but it was all about this fantastic, these fantastic possibilities of playing in France and Japan and all over the world and, and hitting some of the great venues here in the States like Red Rocks or mm. uh, I can't really think of Blossom, or, you know, Big Sheds. It really was a special period for Spyro Gyra. Totally was. And you guys had such international appeal. You know, when I'm, I was doing some research for this interview. And so I started and pulled up the Spyro Gyro stuff on YouTube. I went down just, you know, a YouTube rabbit hole because Spyro led me to like George Benson and Chuck Mangione and, and Grover Washington Jr. And what I noticed in, you know, going through all these videos, the comments were all fresh from just, you know, the past day or two ago. And people were really saying that, this style, you know, and you can call it what you will, uh, contemporary jazz pop, smooth, or just, you know, jazz that grooves, um, which you helped pioneer, by the way. Um, no way around that. Um, it, it, they're saying that it's helping them deal with this crisis. You know, it, it's, it's really lifting their spirits. It's what we need now. It feels good. It makes you wiggle your tush a little bit. You know, it's, and I was just so comforted by that, that, that people were really saying, ah, man, this song, it just puts me in a great mood, and it still continues to do so, Jay. Well, you know, music is a is a is a great analgesic for for all the wrongs in life. Um, we we uh, we've had a history of getting an enormous amount of feedback from soldiers overseas. Mm. That the music was making their lives better. Any one of these wars, the Iraq yeah. War, or Desert Storm, whatever it was. We'd always get these notes from people that were, if not in combat, they were really stuck somewhere. Yeah. And, and the music was helping them. And we've always gotten that. It's always made me really happy. Nice. Yeah, there's just such so much positivity in there. You could tell it, it's just must have been so much fun to record. But, you know, I kind of want to talk about your origins as a musician because as I was reading – you kind of took an alternate route into this music. A lot of people start with the rock stuff. You know, they're Jimi Hendrix fans, or they Eric Clapton, and they find their way to jazz. It was the opposite for you. You started in a jazz household and then eventually found your way into, you know, as a teenager, into rock and pop. Is that the case? Yeah. Um, I was in a classical and jazz household. My mother was yeah. an opera singer. My father, a, a lover of jazz. But it was more than that, you know. I'm... I'm I'm old. I was born in 1951. The very first music I heard was the music of the 50s. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the Beatles. That was right. John Coltrane and Miles Davis. Um, and a, a whole lot of other kinds of music that, you know, early rock and roll. Uh, who, what would be a good, uh, you know, a good example of that? Uh, that's uh, slipping my mind. But anyway. Like Chuck Berry, that kind of stuff? and No, 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 no. Uh, Louis Jordan. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, more yeah. with jazz crossed over. Into Honk and tenors, yeah. Cab Calloway was mixed in there a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, it, 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 that actually preceded rock and roll. That's Rock and roll sort of came out of that, the yep. rock and roll of the 50s. Um, so it wasn't until... I was uh, 12 or 13 that I was introduced to all that other incredible music, you know, uh, Motown, R&B, The Beatles. That, that all happened when I was 12, 13, 14. So I was incredibly graced to have grown up in, in those 
years when I was being musically programmed. You know, we're musically programmed from five to 20. Yeah. That's when all the input comes in and that's when all our references and all our languages are created. And I had this incredibly rich time, which was both uh, the golden age of jazz, the late 50s, and the golden age of uh, pop and rock, which became the, you know, the 70s and the 60s. Um, and uh, when, by the time it came to put my own music together or Spyro Gyra started putting music together, our references were so diverse. They ran from, from John Coltrane to Smokey Robinson and, and, um, and everywhere in between. And in Spyro's case, which I think was unique to a few bands at the time, like Weather Report, there was a world music aspect. Right. What we were doing. We were dabbling in Caribbean music and Brazilian music and African music. And, uh, so it was just the, the coolest time to program your music and and when it came time for us to put something together it was eclectic we had so many references so many good references so many powerful right uh, musical styles to choose from and we never chose uh earlier on you said uh you know we were a big uh forerunner of smooth jazz contemporary jazz i agree with you we were but only 15% of what we were doing right. was that thing that preceded smooth jazz. Right. There were whole other types. We were in the early eighties, we were super popular in, in the Caribbean and South America because we were actually kind of known as a, as a, a Latin tinged band. Yeah. Cause you had that vibe. You were, that was an influence, those rhythms. We had that vibe and we had vibes. And you um, had vibes. Yeah. Uh, as, as so, you know, it's been both our blessing and our curse to have no actual, you know, uh, category that we fit into easily. Right. But I, I go back to my beginnings and my programming, which were opera, jazz, rock and roll, R&B. That's all over the map. Yeah. The music I made was all over the map. And during that time, there was so much innovation, you know, in all those genres from all those areas, you know, everything felt new. And so it felt like, you know, the streams could cross and that was all converging towards this magical era. That was the seventies, you know, can you imagine, you know, uh, going to the Fillmore yeah. and seeing Miles Davis, Ravi Shankar. Right. And yeah. I mean, there were, that, there were no boundaries. And I, you know, that, that also relates to something I've had a long lifetime in the music biz. In the 70s, the corporations really took over the ecosystem. And the, when you say it was such a creative era in the 50s and 60s, it's because nobody had set up boundaries and music testing and how do we make money from this and what's the best way to get the most listeners. None of that was there. It was individuals that ran radio stations with personal taste. And it was, there was so many more possibilities. Even by the time we came along in 78, 77, there was still the possibility of getting something like morning dance on the radio. Yep. Because radio stations hadn't been, made into uh, uh, a money-making machine yet. And I think that freedom in the, in the financial part of the business early on gave freedom to the music. Um, and the music was really coming from artists that, you know, they didn't step into it to get rich or famous. They were just musicians. Later on, so many people have this idea that, you know, I'm going to become a star. And then they make music that sounds like music that stars make, and that makes music less interesting. Yeah. 
It's so true. And I want to talk about the origins of Spira and coming together for that exact purpose, just to play some awesome music. Um, and I want to remind people watching, if you have a question, so if you want to drop a line, if you want to say hi to uh, Jay or to me, uh, feel free to do so wherever you're watching, Facebook, YouTube, write us in. We will get to your questions on air if we have time. Um, but yeah, I mean, you started with that very mission in mind, just to create the kind of music that you wanted to hear. Um, this was in Buffalo, right? It was where the band started. Yeah, my mission in mind at that time was to not work and meet. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. That's a common mission for uh, young yeah. musicians <laughs> at that point. Free booze, yeah. Um, but uh, you were playing. You have one of the best band name origins in jazz. And for people who don't know, would you mind telling that story? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll, I'll go back a little further than usual on this. Um, my family, I, I graduated from high school in Germany. Oh, wow. In Nuremberg, Germany at the American Dependent High School for the military there. And I, I pretty much boarded with, uh, with the army. Um, and uh, my parents were living in Nuremberg, Germany. Um, and I was going to go to school in, in Buffalo because my mother's twin sister lived in Buffalo. Okay. Uh, so the only way I could even get them to let me go back to the States to go to college, they wanted me to go to this university of Maryland extension in Germany, um, was to promise them that I, I'd, I'd be going for as a medical student. So I went up, went to Buffalo to become a medical student and I rapidly devolved down the <laughs> academic evolutionary ladder to English student. Um, and, and then by the end of the first semester, I was a music student. <laughs> but, but that's what brought me to Buffalo. So anyway, my first semester, I did take courses that were kind of pre-med. I took a lot of biology courses. So we go years later, we're in a club called Jack Daniels, which was the most appropriate name ever. Um, and uh, the club owner comes up. We're, we're, we're just jazz every Tuesday night at the time. And he says, I want to start advertising you guys. You're bringing in a lot of people, but we need a name for your band. You know, it can't be jazz every Tuesday night. <laughs> and I thought for a second, I said, jazz to every Tuesday night's an interesting name for a band. Pretty cool. <laughs> but it didn't go that way. So I remembered this algae. This microorganism, this microscopic plant, um, that uh, that I studied in in a biology class, and I threw this name out to the club owner, and it was Spirogyra. Okay. And uh, we came back next Tuesday, and there was the name on the marquee, misspelled, and that's been it. And well, hey, man, that was a fortuitous incident because a great band name. It's, I like it better than jazz on, on Tuesday night, if I'm going to be honest. But well, our first <laughs> tour, you know, we had this wacky first tour where we rented a Winnebago and a, had a truck that leaked oil. And we went from, from town to town and in the south. And we had so many people showing up expecting Greek music. It was <laughs> For the gyro. Nice. Yeah, and the other Spiro thing, and gyros. Spiro Euro. Yeah, yeah. Spiro, Euro, Spiro's Euro. Right. And then the other thing it was was that we had people asking us forever which one is Spiro? Which one is Spiro? <laughs> um, and so we had this really big, strong roadie with big arms and stuff. And we'd always point those people to him. That's Spiro. Let's go there. talk to Spiro. Yeah. <laughs> Too funny, man. I'm sure as crazy as that tour must have been, you look back on it fondly. You know, those rough beginnings are also are often, you know, what builds to great success. So yeah, I'll, I'll give you a, 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 a quick story of that, that tour. Um, I think it was that tour. It might have been a subsequent one. We, we, we drive all the way down to Louisiana, play a show. And on the way out of town, we stop at a, a restaurant called uh, Steak and Cake. <laughs> I like where this is going already. Yeah. And we go in there and we're in the Steak and Cake and the power goes out. And uh, 
we nobody knows how to pay because there's no cash register or nothing. So we uh, we put way too much cash down, you know, on the table and head out. So we're about ten miles down the road, and our drummer, whose name was Eli Konikoff at the time, recall uh, realizes that he he left his stick bag at the steak and cake. Uh oh. So we go back to the steak and cake. We park outside, and Eli walks in to look for a stick bag. And our roadie, Spyro, notices that, uh, whose real name was Greg, notices that there's a guy behind our uh, our truck taking the license plate number. Uh-oh. Okay. So Greg walks out, around, says, dude, well, you know, what's up? Why are you taking the license plate number? And the guy draws a gun on him. Oh, a handgun on him. <laughs> and more than that, he takes the handgun and presses it up against his his face, kind of pushing it into his nose. Okay, so we're going, what the hell? And we start coming out of the 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 Winnebago bus, whatever, and suddenly police cars are arriving from everywhere. Okay. What had happened is the people that worked in the restaurant stole all the money, called the owner and said, those Yankees just ripped us off and headed down the road. Oh, man. <laughs> Little knowing that we were going to come back. Right. So right. you have a scene where the police are there. Oh, my God. There. The guy with the gun is there. And the guy with the gun says to the police officer, you know, Whatever, you know, Freddie. These are the guys. The Yankees that stole my yeah. Stole all the money. <laughs> and we're going. If we did that, why did we come back? <laughs> <laughs> Can't you see our Winnebago? We're okay. musicians, man. Yeah. So then my roadie starts going. Wait a second, officer. This guy like pulled a gun on me and forced yeah. it in my face. I mean, where's that at? He goes, you know. Joe, did you pull a gun on this gentleman and force it into his face? <laughs> and and he goes, well, I I, th I thought they were I thought they were stealing from my place, and I didn't know what to do. So the police eventually get everybody on every side and look at us and say, okay, you can all go now. We 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 think we have this figured out, and. <laughs> and my the roadie goes, what do you mean we can go now? This guy pulled the gun on me. You're not going to do anything? And the uh, the, pol the police guy just said, you know, I, if I was you boys, I'd just be moving on. Whoa. <laughs> that, was our, that was one of our early, early kind of touring the back roads story. that is a very that very blues brothers moment uh <laughs> right? you got yourself into some trouble down there. nice man um hey tell me about when uh todd or tom rather tom schumann joined the group he was 16 years old at the time right the kid yeah there's a lot of stories to that one well tom tom was an uh, an interesting 16 year old because on the on the white side of town, he was an overweight kid going to West Seneca High School and probably, you know, having a hard time in high school. People were not giving him a lot of respect. And at the same time, he was playing on the black side of town in jazz groups, and people thought he was the most amazing thing they had ever seen. So we knew Tom the musician, the incredible one. And he's still in high school. And uh, and I hear him sitting in on our, you know, our gigs. Jeremy Wall was the keyboardist at the time, my good friend Jeremy. And uh, and and this 16-year-old was phenomenal. I mean, phenomenal. He, right. he, he could play like he plays now at 16 in, in many ways. Um, but he was a – he was – you know, Tom has lost all the weight. Tom is a very disciplined person now, but as a kid, he was really overweight. Um, 
And he's going through this schizophrenic thing where he's kind of beloved amongst one community and then in his own like white suburban Buffalo thing, nothing. Mm. And we discover him. So at the, we decide to talk him out of like, you know, finishing high school. <laughs> I'm sure his parents were just totally enthused about that. The musician, <laughs> uh, the, I'm sure they had dropped out of high school. So, um, so, um, so Tom, this, this, this funny story. So Tom comes home, you know, comes, comes, comes to my house and says, okay, I've, you know, I've, I've decided to, to, you know, join the band or whatever. And, and he, he runs down with my, my girlfriend is there. My girlfriend was an Irish Puerto Rican girl named Paula. And um, very pretty girl. And and Tom's running the story about how he gets no respect at school and, you know, it's all of this other stuff. So the last day Tom went to high school, the day before he joined Spyro Gyra, my crazy Puerto Rican Irish girlfriend goes to high school with him and tells F off class after class that you have a genius in your midst. He's uh -huh. using you now. You all have a nice life. <laughs> <laughs> Way to exit the stage on that note. And 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 he, she held court. She was a powerful girl. She held court in every class. Apparently, just telling people, you know, and that was hey, it. Bye to Tom. They, You'll hear about him up. later. Well, kind of <laughs> true, man. And he was an unbelievable, you know, keyboardist. Came from a pretty strong jazz background too, so I mean, you obviously. My father was a really yeah good bass player, really yeah. good, and his mom mom was a jazz singer, um, and uh, yeah, you had the ear for him, man. Well, I, it was just instantly recognizable. Cool, he was cool, a cool. child genius. Cool, man. Uh, and Jeremy, you know, who was the the. the guy I had kind of formed the band with um, and really produced Morning Dance with and a lot of other things. Um, Jeremy was so incredibly gracious. Uh, he said, oh, well, Jay, this is the guy that should be the live keyboard player, you know. Mm. You let me write, you let me contribute, but man, this guy's like a phenom, you gotta grab him. And that was coming from the other yeah, keyboard. Yeah, that's generous of him, yeah. Nice, man. So that's how you know. Hey, I want to get to Morning Dance in a bit because a lot of people are asking online about the inspiration for that song. But I want to talk real quickly I about this kind about of... Paula. Huh? Well, Paula was partly the inspiration for that song. Oh, nice. Oh, well, let's go there right now then because that... Girl. <laughs> that was, you know, it was... Again, we talk about international appeal. That was a huge hit. And it tapped into a vein that I think even a lot of other fusion bands at the time, you know, it was Weather Report, just like you're saying, there was Return to Forever. No one kind of struck that chord with this huge audience around the world. So, yeah, what was the inspiration behind that song? Where did that Caribbean vibe come from? You know, tell me about that a little bit. Gee, where did the Caribbean vibe really come from? Uh, I guess, uh, you know, I spent most of my youth in New York City, and mm -hmm. New York had a international, has an international vibe and there were plenty of Jamaicans and there was some Caribbean music on on the radio. So that sure. I think I actually got it from. I like to think of that the Caribbean inspiration came from living in Buffalo, New York. <laughs> that tropical paradise of all Buffalo. Wishful, all wishful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but morning dance, you know, um, Paula, boy, Paula's getting a lot of airtime here. I wonder if um paula would would dance would dance and exercise in the morning and i would play piano while she did it and um both morning dance and uh shaker song were improvs that turned into songs nice man nice it's it's a gorgeous song i was spinning it this, spinning it this morning um along with Shaker Song. But, uh, okay, I wanted to ask also about this special connection you have to Rick James. Mm. Early on. Not many people know this, but he was kind of instrumental in helping you get off the ground a little bit, and vice versa. 
Okay, I got a great story. <laughs> Who doesn't have a great I, Rick James story? Okay, well, I, I, I'm going to do some name drop. Oh, boy, here we go. Okay, so um, when we were in Buffalo Musicians, uh, a gentleman named Rich Clanger and I formed a production company. And uh, Spyro came out of that as a peripheral act. We were really trying to uh, produce a disco single and an R&B single and all these other kinds of things. And we found a recording studio outside of Buffalo in a town called Clarence, New York. Um, okay. And uh, we managed to talk the owner of this recording studio into selling us 10 days a month lockout for four months. Okay. And we produced this and we produced that. Whenever we had leftover time, we'd record Spyro. And Spyro, that, that, those leftover recordings became the first Spyro Gyro record later. Oh. But we found ourselves with a, without a lot of success on the disco stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for the best. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was for the best. <laughs> uh, um, but we had some leftover time uh, okay. of our 10 days a month. And my, uh, my business partner, Rich, uh, somehow got, a, got in touch with a guy living in Toronto named Rick James. And Rick was a, you know, a performer up there. And uh, he was up in Toronto because... He, uh, he was a draft dodger. He was uh, oh, staying in the oh. States. Okay. Hmm. And so when he, he was dipping his toe into coming back into the States, and of course, Buffalo was a, uh, a border town. Right. Oh, yeah. So he started coming across the border, I guess, and, and, record, and, and he would buy five days of our studio time of our 10 days. And uh, we were around the studio the whole time he did that. And he made come that, that first record, Come Get It. At, uh, at the studio, using your time? Yes, using our time. Yeah. And also, use, I played in the horns. That's right. You were in that band, yes. Uh, and, uh, in fact, it, it was the first time I met Randy and Michael Brecker because wow. Rick was hiring New York guys to come up from New York. And in many cases, it was my first introduction to a whole – level of new york player mm, yeah randy and michael brecker being a perfect example sitting in a horn section with randy and michael brecker like being a nobody from buffalo it was <laughs> mind-blowing and rick was mind-blowing too because rick came in in full character i mean with the big limousine with the, the black girl with the giant afro with the white girl with the big mink the the entire production he was never not rick james he was never not rick james. right okay so and he's dancing and i'm really <laughs> with this guy because he's a force of nature and he's ordering these people around and making a great record whatever you can say about rick james that was an awesome record and i watched the creative process and i was really impressed so years go by spyro gets some success uh, I go to LA and I say, what the heck? I'm going to call up Rick James. So I call up Rick James and I don't know anything about Rick James bad boy stuff other than like he was bigger than life and he's super famous in LA and why shouldn't I look him up? So I, I call him up and he, he knew who I was right away. And he said, you know, I'm going up to Motown today. You wanna you wanna take a ride with me? So he pulls up in this fancy yellow sports car, Maserati or something, and we go up to Motown. And he turns to me as we're driving the car. He says, "We're going to meet Barry Gordy today." And I said, "I'm going to meet Barry Gordy today? Wow, <laughs> that's so cool, Rick. Thanks, that's great." So we go up to Motown. Sure enough, we go right up to Barry Gordy's office. Wow. He's behind this big desk. Um, I was meeting royalty yeah, and uh, we had this brief conversation and he was very gracious. And he said, you know, I heard, I've heard your records and, you know, you guys are really great musicians and, you know, all of that stuff. And then Rick excuses himself to go to the bathroom. 
And Barry leans across the, de the desk and says, dude, you seem like a nice guy. This is not the guy you want to hang with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Word of as soon as you said I got in the sports car with Rick James, I knew this was Barry, for trouble. Barry Gordy's warning me off this guy. You know, the first time I ever met Barry Gordy and the last time. Wow. So, so Rick is still gone, and I'm sure he was doing blow. Yeah. Um, and, and Barry says, I'll tell you what, you know, let me introduce you to Smokey Robinson. Okay. So we marched down the hall and I had a half an hour conversation with Smokey Robinson. So that's pretty much my Rick James story. And I never saw him after that, but I was warned away. And <laughs> thereafter, stories of him putting cigarettes out on people and other yeah. people, exploits emerged. I had no idea of that, no idea of that early on. I was really blown away by Rick but Early and there, there in the beginning, man, you know, helping each other out along the way. I want to get to a little bit more what you're saying about Michael Brecker, because, you know, I know he was also an influence on you and you're playing. And I want to talk some other influences. I want to talk Eye Contact, the solo album, um, in a minute here. But first, I just got to thank a few more sponsors. So thank you to Mac Avenue Records. They have been putting us on the road to great music for more than 20 years now. To start spinning some of their stuff right now, check out the latest from saxophonist Jimmy Green. His new album is called While Looking Up. Um, or maybe check out the new Tower of Power album, Step Up. Uh, I've been spinning that a lot. It's really good. Uh, they're both available now to stream and purchase. For more info, visit Mac macavenue.com um another great record label smoke sessions records based out of manhattan where they have a club too uh hopefully when live music starts up again you know we'll all be able to reconvene up there but anyway their latest album is the intangible in between it's from pianist Oren evans and the captain black big band so Oren evans is a pianist and the newest member of the bad plus this is his signature big band um and he re writes some really really smoking stuff for big band so to check it out uh visit smokesessionsrecords.com that's where you can learn all about that uh, another quick programming note real quick here. This is actually our last edition of the brunch, the Jazz's brunch per se, our 11 a.m. time slot. Starting Monday the 11th, we will be moving into a 5 p.m. time slot. We're going to try that out for a little while, the Jazz's happy hour. And then if we want to go later, hey, we'll go even later. We don't care. Um, so you're going to have to let us know what schedule works for you people watching at home. Anyway, uh, Jay, yeah, I want to pick back up because I've heard in some interviews you say that you have kind of, you know, two, I guess, poles of, of jazz saxophone that were really influential on you. Uh, Michael Brecker on one side and, and David Sanborn on the other. Um, you mentioned that you got to hear Michael very early on, before he was Michael. No, he was always Michael. <laughs> I had this, uh, when I was 15 or 16, Jeremy and I, managed to sneak away from home on Long Island and get into the village to see music. Yeah. And we were, we were uh, walking down Bleecker Street and there was a club called the Bottom of the Gate. And um, there was this band we had never heard of before uh, called Blood, Sweat and Tears. Mm. And uh, it was Blood, Sweat and Tears second gig ever uh it was uh with uh you know cooper was the piano player but it was mike and randy wow the breckers in it and uh we went down into that club and there were we were the only two people in the club and <laughs> and, and, and i got to sit there for a whole hour and a half just I'm totally soaking that in by yeah. my and and frankly, you know, when you say influenced by Michael Brecker, Michael Brecker's greatest influence on me was to teach me to be myself because mm. I could never, ever be him. Yeah. But it, the, just to develop that voice, you know, that Michael, unique voice. Michael was crazy, is yeah. crazy good. And, yeah. you know, as a saxophonist, uh, I recognize the the athleticism, the the Nadia Coma Nietzsche yeah. <laughs> that he's doing, and and uh, I'm good enough to have an appreciation of it. Yeah, without without being good enough to be it, 
Um, so as a technician, he was the height of, of, of saxophone, you know, it, it got more and more complex as the fifties and sixties and seventies rolled around it really was the height of technical saxophone playing. But at the same time, when you hear him on pop stuff, yep. totally heartfelt. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and that's, I think that was the source of everything. And then just like you said, um, you know, confidence to develop your own voice, you know, and, and that's an important lesson for all musicians. Great showcase for yours was eye contact. Um, you know, that came out, you know, relatively late. It was in 2000. You released that. Yeah. You know, guess, um, 20 years I, ago now, it doesn't seem I like had, it. Uh, when I signed the deal for Spyro Gyra, uh, MCA and universal, which ended up being, uh, what I was involved with, even through the GRP years. Mm -hmm. Um, had a clause that said I could do, I wasn't to do solo albums. Wow. I wasn't to compete with Spyro Gyra. Wow. So that's why Eye Contact came out so very late. And then Eye Contact came out on, uh, you know, what lip, a, a record label that was there for a minute. And literally the week it, uh, it was to be released. The record label went belly up. So it was a really disappointing from a, you know, a record release view, uh, point of view for me. Right. Right. But you know, solo album had been on your mind for a while and this was the first time you could realize it. Yeah. You know, yeah. if, if I had followed it with others, I might've done other things differently hmm. on that solo album. What I, you know, I had, prided myself in being the producer mm -hmm. of Spyro Gyra, the artistic producer. Many times the producer just says Spyro Gyra or whatnot, but from the earliest days, it's pretty much my role to oversee things. Right. Um, and when it came to do a solo album, I, I really didn't want it to be Spyro Gyra. That's what I was going to ask. Did you want to do things that you couldn't do with that group? Well, the way I approached it, not making it Spyro Gyra is I backed off from being the producer mm. and I hired all these other people, Chuck yep. Lowe yep. and, you know, Jason Miles was involved. And I, I, I reached out to other, uh, other producers to produce me. Produce. It was like a different producer for each track, right? Or pretty and close. Or a couple. Pretty close. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I actually think on looking back on that record, the, it, it, the quality of that record is uh, is spotty in that it has some really brilliant music on it, beautifully produced, brilliant music on it. And then it has some music on it that I wish I could do over again. Hmm. And that, that was a byproduct of going with so many different, you know, I'm not going to get into who I liked and who I didn't like, but there were producers that really – delivered something that I felt was artistic. And then there were producers that delivered something was more ordinary. And uh, so I think if I had done another one shortly thereafter, and there was another one planned, but the record company went bust, hmm. um, I would have settled in on the producers from that album that I like, producer okay. or producer, and come up with a different, I, I suspect more jazz oriented record okay yeah because you had the mingus tune on there you had the joe zabino tune on there um and you really shined you know in, in those settings man i love the mingus tune i really did think that yeah was, that was a really um and i won't take credit for it that was a guy named jeff beale mm. a hollywood producer i think he did uh, he's done a bunch of hbo scores and uh he's a beautiful score just beautiful that was he, a nice tune He'd done other work for us, and he rescored that version of it, and I thought it was very nice. Yeah, goodbye, pork pie hat, right? Yeah. Was it? yeah. Cool. But much more recently, Spyro released Vinyl Tap. Uh, this came out, what, last year? Yeah. Yeah, so brand spanking new. Um, I love that title, too, by the way. Tell me that was influenced by Spinal Tap. Of course. Okay, great. And you do crank it up to 11, that's for sure. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's an album of... All covers, right? I mean, from across the board. Um, 
yeah, it's really again kind of eclectic. But but I think the it, it had to have come out on vinyl. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, the the choices of material were choices. Uh, maybe 50% of mine, but other guys in the band had things they really wanted to do. And, uh, and the, the material was chosen because it had strong melody and could live without the lyrics. Mm. Right. Also, also, there was a cat, you know, one other thing, you know, smooth jazz, contemporary jazz, whatever, has done the R&B cover ad nauseum right way too many All right. in smooth jazz uh so i didn't want as we stepped into the world of doing covers for the first time in 30 records yeah i didn't want to just be you know doing what many many people had done and of course you know music like earth wind and fire and Smokey Robinson and Marvin Gaye. Of course, that's incredibly attractive music from a melodic point of view. Yeah, but it had been done and done. done. Right, right. Uh, so uh, I shied the band away from choosing uh, R&B. As well, more say right, and we should mention. I mean, you're covering "Sunshine of Your Love." You know, Cream. Uh, uh, you've got to hide your love away, uh, the Cisco kid, you know, you've got some Doobie Brothers, War, Cream. So again, kind of mining this golden era of yeah. Wow. all. Yeah. Um, also, you know, and that might come partly because when I was, when this idea came up, I was really concerned with what I said before, you know, uh, okay, uh, it could be a great tune, but like saxophone just is not going to work on it. And I don't want to go right. The studio and bloody my forehead trying to you know <laughs> play something that just doesn't work on the instrument right and for me and for my style of saxophone playing you know it's kind of like it's singy i'm a singer yeah. I, I play melodically i play long phrases so i was i was really looking in the, the archetype of, of of what's on that album for this idea is what a fool believes I want beautiful, long, arcing melodies that would stand completely by themselves. And that tune is just so melodic. It is, man. And and for you personally, did you find it more of a challenge to record these covers? You mentioned the first time in 30 years that you've done it, or your own material. I imagine there are different challenges in each. Oh, no. This was much easier. <laughs> this was yeah. easier. You bring your own material, you know, everybody has to the pretension to think they're, you know, they're bringing the best thing they've ever done. Or, right. Right. And, and the process of recording it, you know, you're a, you're a parent and, you know, oh, you know, little Johnny's not sounding so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, man. For any creative person, man, that, your but work but is your baby, you know. Step into the world of covers, you know, you're doing something iconic, you know, you don't have to prove that the material's genius. It's already right. genius. All you right. got, got to do is, is you know, do your version of it. Uh, the other way is much harder, much harder, and much more challenging. And also, from an audience standpoint, you know, it's it's much easier for an audience to hear instrumental versions of material they're familiar with than than flat out new music. Right. For the musician, of course. Flat out new music is where it's at. <laughs> I know that's always the line musicians have to walk, you know. But uh, hey, man, is there anything in the works for you, and maybe solo wise, Spyro Driver wise, anything you've been working on? It's a really nice Japanese maple I'm putting into the. Corner. <laughs> All um, right. yeah, uh, good luck with that. At the moment, I mean, it's a very strange time. It is, yeah strange time for musicians i don't know i don't know what the 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 damage will be what there will be on the other side yeah I, how albums will be made you know getting six seven people together in a studio who knows when that's going to be when that's going to happen again uh well there's all sorts of revolutions going on on you know for online recording recording together is you know that's not going to be the issue hmm. It's it's live playing that yeah. 
is truly threatened. And, uh, and not just because musicians can't work for a year. Many of us will survive a year. So, yeah. um, no, it's that, it, can the ecosystem last for a year? Mm. Can the promoters last right. for a year? Can the little theaters last for a year? Will the Blue Note turn into a Starbucks because they can't pay the rent in Manhattan for a year? God, well, I certainly hope not. You know, well, there's my fear. Yeah. And, uh, and is that, is that the, the ecosystem goes down and, and what is already a difficult, you know, it's not easy making your way as a musician. Some of us are lucky, like me, but many really have to grind it out. And, uh, and to have the, the whole system be working at 40% because of damage done, I worry for my, for my brothers. Mm -hmm. I worry for my musician brothers. Yeah. And, and I don't want uh, being a musician to turn into an amateur vocation. Right. Hobbies for everyone, right. Echo system there that supports people that want to dedicate their lives to it and nothing but it. Right. And survive well and do it and send their kids to college doing it. And, and, uh, and that's what I fear, fear for the future of musicians right now. I, you know. There's, I'll, I'll end this with a, you know, a funny, a funny story about musicians and respect, and it has to do with somehow musicians being the last people that are going to survive this. That business partner, Rich Calandra, uh, and I was setting up the production company from the Rick James story, and we went to a bank. It was an M and T bank in Buffalo, and uh, we sat down and we 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 pitched. Uh, the banker uh, to get a loan for the business. And the banker pulled out a couple of slips of paper, like four or five of them. That's more than a couple. <laughs> uh, and, and on the paper were all the vocations, you know, Dr. Dennis, the plumber, blah, 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 right. blah. In, in order of worthiness for loans. Oh, no. And Second from last, oh God, he pointed out was musician. Yikes! <laughs> so my partner goes, "Oh come on, really? What's last?" Yeah, <laughs> and he goes, "Carnival worker." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I know, man. It's uh. So I, I pray the future holds re res respect and prosperity for the music community because it looks difficult. Yeah, man. And as I, you told that story earlier, I myself was an English major. So I, I'm sure I was third to last on that list uh, above musician and carnival worker. But it goes from full circle, Jay, because just like you're saying, when you're feeling down and out, you know, as you know, the future has us feeling sometimes, just like those YouTube commenters, man, fire up some Spyro Gyra, throw on Morning Dance, throw on Shaker Song. That's that positivity we need. You clearly have it. You know, you 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 convey it. You, it just it just radiates through you. So it was clear in the music too. Um, throw it on, folks. Now is the time for morning dance. Uh, Jay, this has been an absolute pleasure, man. Thank you for chatting with me on my birthday. No, yes, this oh, made yeah. me is a very happy birthday. Happy birthday, Brian. Oh, uh, well, thank you very much, Jay. Be well. Uh, Two thirty-two. <laughs> Your life, brother. Well, well, thank you, sir. My hairline says otherwise. I have kids now, so I'm aging quicker than ever. Um, How old kids? I have a three-year-old and a four-month-old. Okay, so you are in the, the next 10 years of raising kids are going to yeah. be the best years of your life because kids yeah, man. are so wonderful. They are. We were talking a little bit before we went on air just about you know the silver linings that are coming you know, out of this tough time. And once then I get to be home every day with my kids, they came in bed with me this morning and we just snuggled for like an hour for my birthday. And, you know, I'm hearing mute stories from musicians all over. I get to be home. I'm not traveling. I'm with my family. That's memories of my life is snuggling with the five and the seven year old and the German. Shepherd. <laughs> exactly, man. Well, Hey, thank you so much again for joining me on the brunch. Um, have a good luck with that sugar maple and uh, be well, man. Take care. Thanks a lot, Jay. Bye-bye. So long.
All right. How about that? Jay Beckenstein of Spyro Gyra. Great talking to him. What a present. What a gift to me on my birthday. So thank you, Jay. Um, I did another quick uh, programming reminder. Again, this was the last episode of The Brunch. As we know it, we are going to be moving into happy hour um, come May 11th, 5 p.m. Eastern time. We will be joining you for live streams. And we are kicking off next week, May 11th, with the guys of Go Go Penguin, a really cool electronic music meets jazz ensemble out of the uk uh tuesday the 12th we've got eric alexander killer killer straight ahead bebop player out of new york wednesday is going to be a cool episode uh we have michael imperioli you know him from the sopranos right uh you know him from summer of sam uh that spike lee joint uh he's an actor but he's also a huge jazz fan and he's going to be contributing to the jazz foundation of america uh online gala which is also taking place this week uh this thursday uh, next week the 14th uh so he's going to be talking to us about his love of jazz his new sopranos podcast which is out now and also joining him on that same show is going to be terrence blanchard the two of them work together on spike lee's movie summer sam so that's going to be an action-packed episode uh on the 14th we're going to be talking with ricky riccardi of the lewis armstrong house museum in queens they have put together a uh virtual exhibit where you can explore some of lewis armstrong's you know personal memorabilia take a walk through the house that'll be really cool um and then the 15th we're going to wrap things up with cat Edmondson. Uh, anyway, hey, I mentioned it earlier. We've got a special promotion right now. We are offering three months of digital access to Jazz's magazine uh, for just 99 cents per month for those three months. Not only do you get access to all the uh, subscriber-only articles on the site, uh, but we will enroll you to receive our print uh, summer 2020 issue, which is coming out in June. It's dedicated to Fusion. So here's Jeff bringing up the offer now. Try three months for just 99 cents per month. Jeff, go ahead and click on that digital issue button. We'll show them the May digital issue, which is out now. Um, cover story is on Bob James. We got a Q&A with Boney James in there, a feature on this new Blue Note uh, pianist, Duduzo Makatini. Um, we've got a performance by Flora Porum. This is all subscriber-only content. And again, if you sign up now for just 99 cents for three months, it's all yours. Um, while we're at it, hey, uh, if you're an independent artist or you know an independent artist, people are asking me all the time, how can I get my album reviewed by Jazz's editors? How do I send it in the mail? Are people even sending mail anymore? Um, this is the way to do it, actually. It's called our Inside Track Program. You just go to jazzes.com, click Submit Your Music, send us everything you want about the album, the album cover, the track listing, personnel. You can send us a link to the SoundCloud or Bandcamp site where we can listen to it. That comes directly to my inbox. That comes directly to our European editors inbox that comes to all the editors inboxes and we do listen to this music I promise you um, you could wind up in a uh, song of the day post in a weekly discover playlist uh, in the pages of our magazine or on this very video series so inside track I encourage you to check it out anyway thanks again for watching anyone we will see you back again on Monday May 11th at 5 p.m. Thank you for joining me on what has been the world's longest brunch. I am stuffed, but uh, looking forward to happy hour come Monday. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye.